Hello. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Judy. Uh, How are you? Delighted to be here with you and uh, with everybody here. So, uh, as we sit here on October 3rd, uh, 2018, we seem to be in a Goldilocks economy. Uh, the economy is growing at a healthy clip. Uh, inflation seems to be under control. The unemployment rate is, uh, is down, uh, some say historically down, and uh, we have a stock market that just seems to keep breaking records. Um, how long can it last? I wish I knew. Um, so you're right. The, the economy initially after the Great Recession began growing in the second half of 2009 and at times struggled, but um, we've made a lot of progress slowly over the years, and now I'm very happy to say that we're, we, we are at 3.9% uh, unemployment is the lowest in 20 years. We're growing at about 3%, which is above uh, almost everyone's estimate of the longer-run trend growth, which implies that if we do grow at that rate, unemployment will go down further. If it does, it'll be the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years since the late 1960s. Meanwhile, inflation is right at our 2% goal. So it's a remarkably positive set of economic circumstances. And um, I, you know, we're working hard to try to, uh, you know, sustain the expansion and keep employment, uh, keep unemployment low and keep inflation right on target. But do you think it can go on indefinitely? Indefinitely is a long time. I, I think uh, there's no reason to think that it can't continue for quite some time. Though. You know, eventually, external events, exogenous events happen, and uh, you know, not every business, business cycles don't last forever, but there's, there's really no reason to think that this cycle can't continue for, for quite some time, effectively, indefinitely. So let's talk about two of those measures. Uh, <clears throat> unemployment, uh, you talked about it, it's under 4%, it's been declining. Inflation, it's hovered, what, around 2% uh, for a long time. Now, the Fed used to consider it a trade-off. When the unemployment rate was dropping, there were worries that inflation was going to go up and vice versa. Has that cycle ended? Is, do we know, are we no longer seeing that kind of a trade-off anymore? So it, is, uh, it has changed. It's, it's, uh, we can't say that it's ended. If you, if you go back to the last time we had unemployment below 4%, was the late 1960s. So for four years, you had unemployment go into the mid-threes, and inflation took off. And that, that's called the Phillips curve relationship, by the way. And so there was a strong relationship between very low levels of unemployment and tight levels of resource utilization and inflation. And what happened after that is there came the Volcker disinflation, and central banks around the world really stepped up and got inflation under control. And to the extent uh, the public believes that central banks will keep inflation around 2%, which is one of our main jobs. Uh, that has tended to reduce the sensitivity of inflation to changes in unemployment. So now, as we say, we have a flat Phillips curve, so it's really more like a Phillips line. Um, that's where we are now. But we got there by having a credible commitment to keeping inflation on target. So it's not something we can, we have to keep that commitment, but for now, our inflation dynamics are that inflation remains at 2% and doesn't react very much to even to further declines. So you repeal the Phillips curve? I'd say it's, uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's dead. It might be resting. <laughs> um, but uh, we, I think, we, we can't say that it's gone away. It's not, op it's not operating right now, but if we were to behave irresponsibly, there's every reason to think we could go back to the bad old days. So that's why we're gradually raising interest rates is so that we can, you know, put some mass on the possibility that inflation will move up quicker than we think and not just assume that it will always be at 2%. That's the practical uh, way we can navigate between moving too fast and moving too slow is to move gradually. Let's talk about wages. Um, growth, wage growth overall <laughs> still very sluggish, notwithstanding Amazon's announcement yesterday that it's uh, raising the minimum wage there. Do you expect that to continue? So wages, if you, if you go back um, about five years, you saw that a, a range of wage and compensation measures were clustered around 2% growth. Now those measures are around 3% growth, which is sort of consistent with the underlying economics. Wages, wages and compensation should cover inflation plus the increase in productivity, which amounts to about 3%. The mystery really is why in a very tight labor market, we, we get reports from all around the country, from country companies in different industries, that, that labor markets are really tight, they can't find qualified people, so it's a bit of a mystery why they're not bidding up this scarce commodity of labor more. 
So we, we do, we have seen a gradual increase in wages, and I, I, my own expectation would be that we would continue to see some of that, and it would be quite welcome. You know, we, we don't think that we're in danger of, of a situation where, particularly imminent danger of a situation where wage increases are going to provoke price inflation, and our focus is price inflation. But, but do, you, do you think something may have fundamentally changed about what's going on with wages? I mean, are we now at a point where workers bargaining power has declined in a, in a significant, long-lasting way. There may be something in that, yes. Uh, it, it's a different, um, I think, uh, in an era of, of globalization, in an era of technological evolution, um, it, it may be that workers and companies have internalized the idea that lots and lots of jobs can be done all around the world or can be you know, supplanted by technology. So there may be something in that. I would say, though, it's, you know, as we always say, it's too soon really to say, you know, wages have been moving up, and that's, that's in keeping with a tight labor market, and we do expect that to continue. Still on jobs. A um, number of experts out there who point out there were many people who were laid off from, from their job, from their work during the recession, who were never able to get back to full-time work, that many of them ended up in part-time jobs, and some of them just stop looking all together. How do you read that? What's your sense of that? No, it's, so it's true. I mean, the, the, uh, the financial crisis cost a lot of people their jobs and their homes and their careers and their hopes and dreams to some extent. And so we want to avoid that. Uh, and, you know, over the 10 years, really, since the depths of the crisis, uh, we have seen a tremendous recovery in the, in the labor market and the economy generally. Uh, labor force participation is back up to normal levels, in fact, even indeed above normal levels. It doesn't mean that this strong economy has is, is, is reached every American. It hasn't. You know, we know that there are demographics and there are regions and industries and individuals who have not, uh, you know, have not been affected and haven't gotten their jobs back. And so, you know, these big negative events are, are quite costly, like a financial crisis. So we've done really a lot of things over the course of the last decade to try to avoid having that experience again. It, it, is it possible, I mean, just continuing on that, that, that we are in a moment when the unemployment rate doesn't tell the whole story, that, the, that frankly, the jobless rate is artificially low, yet the economy is really more sluggish than it looks, that we're not seeing the whole picture? You know, we look at it. We don't just look at the unemployment rate. We look at a wide range of indicators. And by most of those indicators, we are back to, you know, very healthy numbers for the U.S. labor market through history. So the, the next one in line would be the labor force participation rate, which is just below 63 percent now, and that is uh, that is a that's a good solid number if you consider that the popula population is aging and that 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 there's a trend decline in labor force participation. That is a that is a number that's consistent with other very strong economies. But if you look, for example, at different age cohorts within the labor market you will see that some age cohorts have not fully recovered to their pre-crisis level. So, for example, uh, younger workers, particularly younger uh, prime age males, uh, their labor force participation rate is below where it was. But honestly, though, by a broad range of measures, uh, job creation, unemployment, labor force participation, and others, you are seeing quits rate, uh, job openings are at an all-time record. You're seeing a, a range of indicators that indicate that we're pretty close to full employment. Now let's talk about something, I guess, your favorite subject, interest rates. Um, right now, it seems to me half the world is worried that you are raising rates too slowly. They say growth is so strong, the labor markets are so tight, inflation could take off. The other half of the world doesn't want you to raise rates at all or as much as you are. They argue you are widening the inequality gaps that are already out there that, as we've been discussing, wages are too low. You obviously think you're threading the needle about right, but what makes you so sure? Um, so it sounds like we're doing something right. Um, I'll talk about the two risks that you mentioned. So the first risk is that we, that we move too quickly and we prematurely end the expansion and inflation never gets solidly back to 2%. And that's always a risk at this point in the cycle where the economy has been growing now for nine years. It's in its 10th year, year of growth. The alternative risk is that we, we move too quickly, too slowly, sorry, and the too slowly, and the economy overheats, and that can show up in the form of too high inflation, 
or you know, uh, financial market imbalances and that kind of thing. So you look at those two risks. So for a long, long time after the financial crisis, the second risk wasn't a risk at all. We were far away from full employment and inflation was below target. So we kept rates low for a long, long time. We kept them at zero for a long time. And we had a lot of advice to move more quickly and raise interest rates, and I'm very happy we didn't follow that advice because I think it, it benefited the country, benefited uh, workers and, and their families. So um, now we come to a situation where unemployment, as I mentioned, is close to a 20-year low and headed lower by all accounts. And the, the really uh, extraordinarily accommodative low interest rates that we needed when the economy was quite weak, we don't need those anymore. They're not appropriate anymore. We need interest rates to be gradually, very gradually moving back toward normal. And that's what we've been doing now for, you know, basically three years. And interest rates have just now, in real terms, moved above zero. So interest rates are still accommodative, but we're gradually moving to a place where they will be neutral. Not that they'll be restraining the economy. We may go past neutral, but we're a long way from neutral at this point, probably. But which of those worries you more, that you could be going too fast or too slow? You know, I mean, almost by definition, I see them as balanced because uh, I, I feel we, if, if we didn't, if we put no mass on overheating, we wouldn't raise rates at all. And if we, if we put no mass on the other, we'd raise rates much faster. But I, I think we, we have to take both of those risks very seriously, and we do. So we try to navigate between them. And, I, you know, I think we're, we're always going to be looking carefully at incoming data, always, to adjust uh, our policy if we, if we see things getting stronger and stronger and inflation moving up then we might move a little quicker, and if we see the economy weakening or inflation moving down, we might, we might move a little more slowly. So we, we never think, we're never sure that we have this right. Uh, we, we're always aware that there's great uncertainty about the path of the economy. Another kind of way of thinking about the job picture, some people are saying that the great worries of the future, uh, automation, robotics, AI, that that's actually already started to affect the workplace in ways that we cannot fully see and can't fully measure. How much does that concern you? You know, just to, more generally, I would say, we, when I say it's a strong economy, I mean that in a cyclical sense that, you know, we're near full employment and 2% uh, inflation. We have significant longer-term issues to face as a country that the Fed really can't affect. And some of those are things like globalization and, and the effects of trade, which, uh, which can be positive on net, but can affect individual constituencies, um, and the effects of technology. So uh, you mentioned um, you know, labor replacing technology. It's a, these are huge issues, but they're not issues that we have control over. Uh, we sort of have to take those, those uh, trends and developments as something that we, we just take as a given and try to monitor them. But, um, you know, the, the history is very much that uh, if, if society produces people with, with the skills and aptitudes needed, that technology can lift, evolving technology can lift everyone. And it did so for a very long time. But U.S. educational attainment has flattened out here, particularly relative to other countries uh, in the last 40 years. It's not going up as fast as it was. And I think uh, that's part of why if we're going to keep up in a, in a global world where education levels are rising, where technology makes it possible to do jobs anywhere, we're going to have to have very well-educated people who can benefit from technology. And that's, I think, a big, a big issue that, that we can't really affect. President Trump, uh, as you've noted, uh, he started out early on talking about how he believes the Fed should remain independent. And he's been given credit for appointing high-quality nominees uh, to the Fed board. But he's also, this summer, this past summer, criticized the Fed, the policy of raising rates. Do you write that off as, <coughs> excuse me, as just politics, or does it put some kind of pressure on you uh, as the chairman of the Fed, and, and does it harm the institution, because this is something presidents have rarely done? You know, we, my focus is, uh, is essentially on controlling the controllable, and that's, we, we control what we do. <laughs> <laughs> what we do at the Fed. And, you know, this is, um, to anyone who has known our institution over time, this is just who we are and I think who we'll always be, which is we're a group who we, you know, we're quite removed from the political process and we, we look at the best thinking, we look at the data very carefully, we try to get disparate views, try to come to a consensus and try to do the right thing. 
We're insulated from political cycles because our terms run, they don't run con continuously or at the same cycle as elections. And we just try to do the right thing for the medium and longer term for the country. And, uh, you know, that's, I think that's why a lot of people want to work at the Fed is because there's tremendous satisfaction in doing that. We don't let other things distract us, and, and uh, we're just going to focus on, on those jobs. That's just always how we're going to be. Did you have a communication privately with the president after he made those comments? No. Uh, <laughs> another, another uh, I, I know this is not something you directly are involved in, but trade policy. Um, if, I mean, given where we are with uh, tariffs and so forth, if the United States and China were to end up, end up in an all-out protracted trade war, what effect do you think it would have on the economy, and how would that affect your ability uh, to, to move policy at the Fed? So you're right. We don't do trade policy, and we don't, we, we don't uh, you know, we have a very specific mandate from Congress and the tools to achieve that mandate. We're clearly not responsible for trade policy, but we do think about the effects of trade policy to the, uh, you know, on the economy. And they could be substantial over time, although really nothing that's happened to date seems to be having much of an effect. Uh, so I... All I can say about this really is that if, if we, you know, free and fair trade are, are a benefit to all countries, basically, and including our own. And uh, if we wind up, this, if this process winds up producing an era of even lower tariffs, tariffs have been coming down for 50, 60 years to pretty low levels, historically low levels. Uh, if we wind up with lower tariffs, broadly speaking, and, and people, you know, obeying the rules of global trade, then that'll be good for us, and it'll be good for other countries, too. If, if perhaps inadvertently we wind up instead in a more protectionist era where countries are, are putting tariffs back and forth on each other, then that will be bad for American workers and for the American economy and also for, for other countries as well. In particular, um, with China, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate. It's really, not our, it's really not our job to manage that relationship on trade. But certainly, if China's a very important economy, and... You know, we if, if the Chinese economy weakens, uh, then that that is certainly going to have effects on on other economies around the world, including ours. You said recently that you've been hearing a rising chorus of concerns from businesses around the country about tariffs. What exactly are you hearing? We um, before we F, the FOMC meets eight times a year, and before those meetings, uh, are the reserve banks to have a, a set of uh, relationships that they have very very you know, large number of relationships in the business and nonprofit communities around the country. They talk to people every cycle. Uh, they put that information in what we call the beige book, and then they come to the FOMC meeting that the bank presidents do, and they tell us about it. So we've been hearing, as I mentioned, a rising chorus of concerns. People are concerned about rising material costs and tariffs and the loss of markets and supply chains in a big way. Concern these supply chains have been uh, you know, under construction and now very fully built out over the course of almost a quarter century. So they're very important to the way the global economy works. We've been hearing concern about that. As I mentioned, you don't see anything in the numbers, and maybe you wouldn't expect to yet, but you, you don't see, we don't see, detect any slower growth or lower investment or lower hiring or any, any of the effects that might flow from more uncertainty on the part of business. What keeps you awake at night, if anything, when it comes to this economy and the world economy? Basically everything. You know, nobody, nobody wants a central banker who sleeps well, right? Uh, what good is that? Um, you know, I, 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 we, we, if we get getting monetary policy right, it, the question you started with is, is so important for the public. And so we, all of us who work at the Fed think this is the thing we think about all the time if we work on monetary policy is we've got to get that right. And because, um, you know, the, the benefits of doing that are, are very broad for the country. And, you know, there, it's a world full of risks. Many things can go wrong, and I probably lose sleep over different things every night. Do you worry, how much do you worry that there could be another financial crash? My, my guess is that the next uh, set of problems we have won't look a lot like the last set of problems we had. You know, I, I think there's, we don't detect um, measures of financial stability of financial instability as being elevated at this time. They're sort of in the moderate range in, in our view, the view of our staff, and certainly in my view. So it's, it'll be something else, you know, a cyber attack or some kind of global event. Those are the kinds of things. Or maybe it'll surprise us and look exactly like the last one. But I, we don't really see 
we don't see the kind of buildup of risks in, in the financial markets or let alone in the banking system where, where we, we see much higher capital and actually less risk being taken. Last question. Um, a number of American institutions, I guess this is a the way to put it, have <coughs> taken a hit when it comes to public trust in recent years. Do you think the Fed has suffered in that regard? And if so, what do you think can be done to fix it? I think institutions, public and private institutions, all around the world are under tremendous pressure. They're losing prestige, losing respect. And I think, it, you know, so we're absolutely committed in a democracy. An institution like the Fed, which has some independence and, you know, um, a lot of authority and its decisions make huge differences in people's lives, we're really committed to transparency and doing everything we can to explain ourselves to the public, to public's representatives in Congress. You know, we want to be held accountable, and we're, this is just following on the work that all my predecessors have done. We're looking for new ways to be more transparent, to explain ourselves better and more clearly, and we think that's just, you know, something that we are obligated to do in a democracy. So that's really what we're doing, and it's a big part of what we work on. Meanwhile, we're in Goldilocks time. Your words, not mine. <laughs> Chairman Jay Powell, thank you very much. Now, please welcome the Athletics, Margaret Lowe. Sit tight, everybody. We have something more in store that I promise, I really, really promise you don't want to miss. Um, first of all, thank you, Chairman Powell and Judy Woodruff.